Good afternoon and welcome to another exciting edition of Echo Live. My name is Christian. I'll be your host for today. And I am broadcasting from the Echo Live Distance Learning Studio at the Michigan Science Center in beautiful Midtown Detroit. And we're going to have a good time today. So I see that some people are already starting to log in. We're going to have a really good, interesting discussion and an exploration like we always do on Echo Live. I'm really excited to be here with you. Well, first of all, it's a little bit of housekeeping we want to do. If you're familiar with the Echo Live program and you've been following us, go ahead and type uh, in some information into the chat feature where we will be having dialogue, asking questions. So tell us where you're from. Um, how are you watching this presentation? And, and, and why don't you share with us your grade level? If you're a student in K-12, we'd love to know what grade you're in. That'll help us tune the content a little bit to make it all work. So, you know, I think it's so exciting, uh, such an exciting time in science right now. And today we're gonna be talking about paper instruments. Paper instruments. So many of you have made incredible things out of paper before. I mean, when I was a kid, I used to make paper airplanes. They were exciting devices that you design and fold and you can make different kinds. And then you just kind of fly them across the room and you perfect them, tweak them a little bit to make sure that they fly straight. You also may have used uh, you know, origami before, or used that technique or created baskets out of paper. Um, so there's lots of things we can do, but what about paper instruments? If you were to create a paper instrument, what kind of paper instrument would you create? That's what I'd like for you to put in the chat feature. Tell me the kind of paper instrument you might create. What are some of your thoughts? It's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the word instrument. Well, one of the things that I think about in terms of instruments um, are not so much instruments like we think about as musical instruments. The instruments that we're gonna to create today, these paper instruments are scientific instruments, instruments that are used to extend our senses. And those senses help us discover, explore, um, compare, contrast, and to find out things that we might not know based on the questions we asked about our universe, about the world around us. So these paper instruments will help us create lots of cool things that will allow us to begin to explore uh, the night sky. So some of you may have already been out in the night sky looking for Comet Neowise. Last week on our show, Paulette talked about the comet and it even did a comet building activity. Well, we're gonna show you how to find the comet as part of this, but it's more about time and understanding how time relates to the sky, how it moves in terms of cycles of time and space. Sound like it's fun? All right, well, let's get a little backstory so that we can discover this. We'll do a quick screen share. And we're gonna look at this PowerPoint presentation that allows us to be able to give us the ability to, to uh, see a little bit more into this subject. So these are some of the topics we'll be talking about, telling time, kind of a fancy word, archaeoastronomy, if you're not familiar with that term, horizon astronomy, gyroscopes, and then we're gonna use some astron uh, astronomy software called Stellarium Web, and then build uh, for our activity a star clock. You ever built a star clock before? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. This might be the first time, but we'll get a chance to give you some information for some of the templates that we will be using today. We will share this in, um, uh, online so that you can get these after the show and get an opportunity to be able to do one of these for yourself safely at home and take it outside and observe the sky. So this is an exciting thing. So let's jump into time. Let's talk about time. Now, most of us probably, when we think about time, you might be thinking about time using your smartphone, but the ancients thought about time in different ways in which they use the sun as a way to track and mark the passage of time. So this is a sundial. This particular sundial has a shadow caster. It's the part that extends out of the plane and sort of blocks the sun's light. Blocking the sun's light creates a shadow. That thing that sticks out is called a gnomon. It begins with the letter G, so it's a little tricky. It's G is silent, but it's a gnomon or a shadow caster. And that shadow caster puts a shadow on the face of the dial 
where demarcated across the face of the dial are the hours. So for each mo movement of the sun, a shadow is cast over the hours and it moves across the course of the day. Now, obviously, uh, there are moon dials, but you can't use a sundial really at night. You need the sun. But there's other ways to tell time. So shortly after using the, or not so shortly after <laughs> using sundials, we'll go to this next slide. You might be familiar with this. Like sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. So here's an hourglass. And if you've ever played around with these things, they are fascinating. They're actually mesmerizing to some extent, but it's another way to measure time. Still another way is something called a wristwatch. So many of you may still be wearing wristwatch, wristwatches. Some people have stopped wearing wristwatches as they start to use their phones. So it's another way of, tell, of telling time. Let's keep going. So as we learn this, there are different things that the ancients used and they created sculptures and structures um, out of stone. And they used these to mark the passage of time, but not only the passage of time, but also the ability to mark the equinoxes where you have equal day and equal night twice a year. Um, this happens in the spring and in autumn or fall. You're probably familiar with that. Or times in which the sun is highest in the sky during the summer solstice or lower in the sky during the winter solstice. And all of this has to do with the passage of time, how the earth moves and how it moves in space around the sun in its orbit called a revolution. When it spins on its axis like this, that's called a rotation. It's also known as one day. All right, so when we look at Stonehenge that you can see here, I've had a chance to visit Stonehenge. And if you see on this next slide, it is an absolutely gorgeous megalithic structure. I mean, you have never seen anything like it. These stones are erected, they are tall, they are heavy, but they're arranged in such a way that it allows the viewers to be able to mark things like the equinoxes or the solstice using the heel stone or other types of stones that surround the circle on the Salisbury Plain that uh, um, you can find in England. Now, these structures were built thousands and thousands of years ago. I don't even think they know exactly when Stonehenge was built, but they know that it's at least, scientists have calculated, it's at least 3,000, perhaps 4,000 years old or older but it's not the oldest stone circle structure that has been found. As a matter of fact, there's another one in Egypt that was found several years ago called Nabta Playa. It's an astronomical stone circle. And the more that we explore these circles, the more that we have learned that the ancients have discovered lots of cool things about the sky, things that today we take for granted because we use our wristwatch or we use an hourglass, or maybe we use a sundial. Most of us probably use our smartphone, but there are different ways to tell time. But this is how the ancients did it and used it for planting, for agriculture, and also spiritual and religious observances that happened on an annual calendar. Really interesting stuff. Let's keep going. So this is a great book that I believe is out of print, but I used to use this to help me think about teaching astronomy years ago when I worked at a planetarium. Many of you have gone to a planetarium, you know it's a, it's a big domed room that you get to explore the sky indoors, which is fun in the comfort of an indoor uh, weatherproof environment. And, uh, but cycles of time and space are really important to think about because we experience them every day, even if you're not looking outside. So this book by Jay Ryan, I think is probably the quintessential text for me. And I'm gonna reference this as we go through our talk today. So if we look at this next slide here, you'll be able to see that the day is something that's really interesting to explore. You see that the most basic unit that we talk about when the earth spins around on its axis, that is called the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun, but it's really, we define it as the day. And the day is a different time on different planets, but on earth, it's a, about 24 hours. And so here, this image, you can see the sun rise in the east and if I don't have another slide of this, but if you can show it set in the rest. So if we go back to the full screen here off the PowerPoint for just a moment, 
I'm going to share with you some of our celestial buddies here that will help us out with this process. The sun we obviously see as rising in the east and setting in the west. So our celestial buddy here, the sun, you can see all of these little cool things that are coming off of it, representing the prominences and such on the photosphere. And our sun is 93 million miles away. And even that far away, you can still feel the heat of it, right? It gives us heat, it gives us light, and it allows us to tell time. But it still rises in the east, goes high overhead in the, in the northern hemisphere here, and sets in the west. Okay, what else rises in the east and sets in the west? Any other astronomical objects that you might be able to add into the chat feature and share with me some that rise in the east and set in the west? Let's see, some of you might be thinking about something like this, the moon. You know, the moon is our closest neighbor in space. It's also a natural satellite. It's actually a satellite, but it's a natural satellite of the Earth. And it goes around almost during the course of a, of a month, a, a, um, approximately 30 days, a little bit less. And it also rises in the east and sets in the west. You can see it in the daytime sometimes, depending on the phase. And what else do you think rises in the east? and sets in the West, astronomical objects, things that you can see with the naked eye. Sometimes when the sky gets a little bit dark and you see it pop up, it's the planets. If you've never seen this guy through a telescope, you might wanna take a look with the beautiful rings. It's Saturn. So the planet Saturn, which is very far away from Earth, but still in our solar system, also rises in the East and sets in the West. Well, you know, the question is, why do all these things rise in the East and set in the West? They do because of this, the Earth. We are standing on the Earth right now. And if we were to look up at the sky as the Earth is spinning, we start to begin to see changes occur. And these changes can be used to mark cycles of time and space. So let's go back to the PowerPoint for just a quick second and take a look at this. So if you can see us and imagine being out in space like the Apollo astronauts were, you know, that's such an, an incredible feeling to fly away from Earth going to another celestial body. You'll see quickly that there is one side that's light and the other side that's dark. That's the day side and night side. We know this already, right? But it does affect the way we experience day and night and time. So on this next slide, you can see what I'm talking about. Imagine yourself standing like a giant on the planet Earth, the third planet from the sun, and you're looking out into space at the sun. Now you have to be careful. You don't always wanna look directly into the sun because it can blind you. It's, um, but if you can imagine being out in space and seeing this from the ground, we're so small that it just looks like the sun is on the horizon, on the edge as it rises in the east and sets in the west. So let's go to another slide. You also may notice that at nighttime, you can see other changes. Now. Remember we said we tell time by the sun, but we're really telling time by the stars because the sun is the closest star to the earth. Its actual name is Sol, Sol Invictus, I think is the actual technical name um, of the sun in Latin. And you can notice some familiar connected dot star pictures like are depicted here, like the Big Dipper and Cassiopeia, and even the North Star. These um, shapes, uh, represent connected dot star pictures or recognizable part of constellations called asterisms. So although we have the sun, the moon, the planet, and the stars rising in the east and setting in the west, actually not all stars rise in the east and set in the west. And these are the ones we're going to focus on today. They're the ones that are called circumpolar constellations. So let's take a look at the next slide here. So when we go to this next slide, you will find something really interesting because now we're gonna start putting all this together as we think about times of space. Imagine yourself on the earth, right? On the left and then um, from space on the left and then on the right on the horizon. Guess what? You see the same stars, whether you're off the earth. They're so far away, the shapes don't change even when the astronauts were going to the moon. But there's something really interesting about the middle of this image and do you know what it is? What's interesting about it is that one star that's kind of all by its lonesome, it's the star, wait, do we know what the star is that we're gonna talk about? Seven stars in the Big Dipper or Ursa Major, the Big Bear. 
the two stars at the edge of the bowl are pointer stars to this star. Does anyone know what the star is? Is it the brightest star in the sky? No, that would be the sun. Is it the second brightest star or the third? No, but there it is. It's the pole star, also known as Polaris or the North Star. Why is it important? It's because as this little earth spins on its axis like this, once every 24 hours, I believe it's like uh, 23 hours and 56 minutes, the pole or the axis of spin points towards this star, which is called the North Star. So let's take one more slide and let's see what we're talking about here. There we go. Okay, I think this might be my final slide here. So the stars are not really moving and rising in the east. It's an illusion. That means your eyes are sort of playing tricks on you. From the perspective of the earth, the stars are rising in the east and setting in the west, but there's some circumpolar stars around the pole star that just go round and round and round and they don't appear to do any one of those things. So let's explore why that might be the case. So I have something fun that I'm gonna share with you. It is called, anybody know what this is called here? I don't know if you can see it. Maybe I can uh, get a, a moment to sort of zoom in on it here. Look at that. That's a gyroscope. Gyroscopes are really fun things to play with. And so I'm gonna do a little bit of unboxing here and we're gonna explore this gyroscope because you'd be surprised just how close gyroscopes are to you. You might be thinking, well, I don't have a gyroscope right now, but you know, you might be standing on one, a spinning object with a, that's rotating around an axis. So as I unbox it here, I have a couple of things, a little pedestal for it stand on, sort of this rip cord here that I use to get it going, but I can also use a string. Now in, in a future presentation, I might do some tricks like yo-yo types of tricks with a gyroscope, but in this case, I'm just gonna show you the gyroscope for fun. We'll do a quick demonstration. So one of the things you may notice about the gyroscope is it has a spinning wheel. And this wheel, once it gets going, starts to exert, um, exhibit something called rotational inertia. So if we know about Newton's first law, that inertia says that an object in motion will remain in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Uh, likewise, an object at rest or constant velocity will do the same. Well, you know what, when you have something that's not in linear motion, but it is in rotational motion or circular motion, it can do the same thing. Want to see it? How many of you have actually tried this before? So in the chat feature, tell me if you've used a gyroscope before. I'm going to go ahead and thread this. So this is me putting the rip cord in here and I have my little pedestal and I'm going to give this a really good go and let's see what happens. Wait, before we do, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen to this gyroscope? Let's try something here. If I put it on here and I just let it go, remember we're in a gravitational field, so gravity wants to tip it over if it's not perfectly balanced. And I'm sure there's probably a way I could get this perfectly balanced and it would balance, but air currents in the room or maybe even the sound of my voice, the compression waves of sound might knock this thing over. So how could I get this thing to stay up like this? Any guesses? Any ideas? All right, so let's try it. What I'm gonna do with our little gyroscope here, and this will be really quick, is I'm gonna go ahead and pull this rip cord. And when I do, it'll get this wheel spinning. There's the wheel spinning. And then I'm gonna set it there and put it on its pedestal. And what do you notice? Let's use our observation skills. First it started spinning and now we see it kind of rotating around and wobbling like a top. Well, that wobble, the technical name for that is called precession. It's called precession. But what else do we think wobbles like this? Maybe this guy? Yeah, it's the Earth. The planet that we're standing on, our favorite planet, it better be your favorite planet. This is the planet that sustains the life uh, that's on here on Earth and we have to protect it. But let's take a look at the Earth and this gyroscope as it moves around. We're learning more about this idea of conservation of momentum, angular momentum, which is rotation. I'm gonna do this one more time and then we're gonna to move to our final activity. So, but this allows us to stabilize this and these are used on aircraft for turn coordinators and um, other kinds of heading indicators that are used for navigation. They even use spinning wheels like this on the trip to the moon. 
And you know what else is a gyroscope? The Earth also is a spinning object. And as it spins around, it maintains its stability where this would represent a point to the North Pole. And every 26,000 years, the Earth wobbles all the way around or precesses to other stars beyond Polaris. So maybe the star, one day the star Vega will be our North Star. All right, so now let's explore one other thing that we think is sort of the last cool thing that we wanna do. And I'm gonna use my document cam for this because what we're going to create is a, a star clock. So we've learned about time, space, things rising in the east, setting in the west, all kinds of cool stuff that can happen. But the Pacific Science Center in Seattle created something called a star clock, and I've used this thing for years. You'll be able to download this online and you will find this to be really a lot of fun and something easy to do. All you need is a set of, uh, to print this out on cardstock, I use cardstock for this, some uh, brass uh, fasteners that you can use, and a pair of scissors. Now you don't need scissors this fancy, you can use snub nose scissors if you're uh, a, a new user to scissors, something a little bit more safe. And you'll notice on this two parts to it. There is the face of the dial that has the familiar connect the dot star pictures or constellations, also known as the recognizable ones, asterisms, with the North Star, the Pole Star in the middle, of course. And then here you can see this circle that shows you not only the hours on a clock, meaning our rotation of one day, 24 hours, but also our revolution, which represents the months of the year approximately 30 days each. So, you wanna try this? So I'm gonna to try to just cut one of these out. You just use the scissors and you start to cut these pieces. Now, we don't have enough time for me to go through and cut, so I already assembled these slightly, but I'm gonna show you just how easy it is to cut these out. So take your time, and if you need a little help with the scissors, perhaps an adult, or an old, a big brother or big sister can help you. But as you cut out the face of this dial, you will be able to create the face of your star clock. So I'm being a little sloppy in the interest of time, but this gives you an idea of what we can do here. And then I also have the base of the dial, which I will cut out. And as I go around like this, I'm being careful not to cut off my months because this is part of my instrument. Remember this instrument actually models the motions of the stars with respect to the sun, our calendar, our revolution, rotation, and let's see, our position with respect to the stars as we watch them. So you'll have these two pieces and then all you need to do is to grab a brass fastener like this. You can see how small these things are. And then you can use this fastener to be able to push a hole right through here like this. And then sometimes I take it out, it's a little bit easier to do it this way. And I'll put another one in through here. And now all I have to do is take this part, the face of the star clock and the base of the star clock, line them up and guess what? My brass fastener represents the North Star. And that's how this will spin. So just a little bit of handy work around the back allows you to be able to fasten this into place and now you have a fully, fully functional star clock. Isn't this cool? So I made this star clock and it allows you to be able to see things. So just in our last few minutes, we're gonna explore this because you know what? Hey, we're creative people, right? Even as scientists, you can also do some fun stuff like I did, which is color the different months of the year and it makes it just that much more cool, right? You guys like this? I like it, I think it's cool. All right, well, now what we're going to do with our clock is let's learn how to use it. I'm gonna do just a quick demonstration of how to use it, and then we'll go to Stellarium and see if we can find some things. You wanna try it? All right, let's try it. The first thing that you need to do for this star clock is recognize that this is also a star map. And although you use star maps on the ground looking at things, in this case, you want to be able to hold it up to the sky. And I'll demonstrate that a little bit later. So what month are we in? Okay, we'll spin the wheel, find the right month, and then tick, 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 tick. Ah, we're in July. 
So you can do this in two ways. You put the month that you're in at the top, and then you can look for the time. So right now, believe it or not, the stars are actually in the sky, but those stars are not visible because of the sun's light. So here on Eastern time where we are in Detroit, we are closing on, let's see, let me put in the afternoon between two and 3 p.m. So this would be representative of how you would see the Big Dipper asterism. It would be high in the sky with Queen Cassiopeia seated on her throne lower in the sky. But you know what happens when you go to 4 p.m., 5 p.m., 6 p.m., 7 p.m., post-meridian is what p.m. means. Um, and then down when the sun starts to set, we start to see the Big Dipper down here. And Comet Neowise is just below the bowl of the Big Dipper. That's how you can find it. So you can use it in that way. So let's go to Stellarium and see if we can see this circumpolar motion in place for our star wheel. So this will be the final demonstration that we show you here using Stellarium Web. You just go to stellarium-web.org and you can use this free planetarium software. I hope you will try it out. Okay, so here we are later in the afternoon and we're just gonna accelerate time. And before we do, let's put some constellations up so that you can see that the constellation figures, even though you can't see the stars in the daytime, they're still up there because we're still out in space. Now let's advance time slowly. As we go through an advanced time slowly, you can start to see the motion, the gentle motion. Do you see the North Star anywhere? Some of these are kind of hard to see. But right there on the meridian, the line, the imaginary line that connects North and South in the sky is the last star in the handle of the Little Dipper, which is Polaris. And as we continue to move, you'll see it's like the Little Dipper actually pours into the Big Dipper. And there it is as part of the constellation of Ursa Major or the Great Bear. So as twilight comes and the sun goes down, the planets are sometimes the first thing you see and then the stars. So when you look north tonight, you know what you're gonna see? Hopefully if it's clear, you're gonna be able to find, and I know you can, the familiar shape of the Big Dipper. It's an asterism in Ursa Major the Bear and there it is three stars in the handle, four stars in the bowl. And these two stars, Dubé and Merak, the pointer stars, point right to the star Polaris. So the wheel of the sky turns along the last star in the Little Dipper, which pours into the Big Dipper. And Cassiopeia, you know, if you got a pair of binoculars, which I have on, on my podium here, you can actually see Cassiopeia. And you know what you notice? it's actually within the plane of the Milky Way. So that means if you point some binoculars towards Cassiopeia, you'll be looking into the face of the galaxy. So what do you think? Is this a cool thing to see how it works? Let's keep the clock moving and see if there are any questions that people have about what we talked about today. So as the clock on Stellarium is moving, I'm going to also move my star clock. And do you see how it's working? Your star clock tracks the motion of the earth or the apparent motion of the stars. And you can start to find lots of cool things. You can even tell time. You know, one other thing is you can also tell your latitude uh, by sticking your fist out like this. So if we go to the full, uh, back to the regular screen for just a second as your questions are coming in, if you hold your fist out at arm's length on the edge of the horizon going north and you stack your fists up, they're about 10 degrees of arc. So once you stack them up, you'll see in Detroit, it's about four fists up or close to 40 degrees. That's how you also know your latitude on earth in the Northern hemisphere. So lots of cool things that we're doing here at the Michigan Science Center, star clocks. So what are some of the questions that we have? What kinds of things are you interested in? Questions. Okay. All right. So as your questions start coming in about star clocks or cycles of time, I just want to take this time to thank our donors and supporters. You know, it is wonderful to have support 
for co from corporations that really care. They care about STEM and they deliver innovations to the field, things that you experience every single day. So I'd like to thank Ford Motor Company and Denso for providing the support for Echo Live Distance Learning. You know, we're closing on 100 shows. We've done, I think, 80 plus shows since we shut down on March 13th. And it is a wonderful thing to know, even during the coronavirus and COVID-19 pandemic, when things are a little challenging for nonprofits like ours, to know that organizations will step up and support you because they believe in science, technology, engineering, and math, and the pipeline of young people like you that are going to explore these fields and hopefully solve some of the problems that we want to take on as engineers into the future. So let's see if there are any quick questions here. Well, one is why is Pluto not a planet anymore? Well, Pluto is a planet, but it's a kind of a, a, a classification of a planet called a dwarf planet. And the reason why this dwarf planet um, status started is because we always discover more things in science. It's never over, you're always exploring. And you know, it's interesting. They found other smaller planets out in Pluto's orbit in something called the Kuiper Belt. And so because Pluto did not clear out all the space in its orbit is one of the three criteria for what makes something a planet like Earth or Saturn or Jupiter. And so Pluto is in that category of a dwarf planet because there's lots of other things out there My, um, like Eris and I'm trying to think of some of the others, um, uh, Haumea and other smaller dwarf planets that you can look up and discover. So it just got demoted, but we still love Pluto. As a matter of fact, when the New Horizons mission went out to Pluto, we noticed that on the face of its surface, it almost looked like it had a heart. So it missed us. Any other quick questions before we end? All right, well, as they're coming in, I just wanna say I'd like to thank um, uh, all of you for joining us and also let you know that we're open. Even in the COVID-19 pandemic, we have worked with NSF International. It's based in Ann Arbor for sanitation and create a better facility for us that's as safe as possible. We had a ton of people coming out to the Science Center today to check us out since we've been open the last two and a half weeks or so. And it's called our Free Summer of Science sponsored by Aramco. So that means free admission is waived and we'd love to have you come out and see us here in Midtown Detroit. Well, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for another exciting adventure and edition of Echo Live, our distance learning program. We're gonna keep bringing you science. We're gonna keep bringing you questions and cool stuff that you can do at home. And I want you to tune back in because in a few minutes, we're going to upload the link so that you can make your very own star clock at home and enjoy observing the sky. Thank you very much for joining us and I'll see you next time.